You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have my friend Richard Fox back on the show with me today. Richard is also joined by Jonathan uh, Brazy. (laughs) Please tell me if I got that right, Jonathan. Uh, Richard's joined by Jonathan Brazy, and they have a fantastic new book. It's called Hell's Horizon. And uh, let me tell you what, if you love military sci-fi, this is a must have for your uh, either bookshelf or your Kindle or audio book. Uh, I have not heard the audio book yet, but I'll tell you what, as reading through this book, I can only imagine how uh, how this comes alive. Uh, welcome to the show, Richard and Jonathan. Thank you. Always a pleasure. So, Richard, you've been on the show plenty of times before, and I'll put links in the show notes where people can uh, can find an earlier episode with you. So I, I want to ask Jonathan. Uh, but, Jonathan, I love to ask people um, a, a show, a, a question at the beginning of each show, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Back in 19, must have been 1974, before I went to the uh, Naval Academy, my brother dragged me to a small science fiction convention in Des Moines, Iowa. and I met Gordon Dixon there, had a chance to sit down. I mean, there must have only been about 50, 60 people there, so you had a good chance. And then I paid $6 to have lunch with a real-life CIFWA member, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and uh, sat down, and I listened to this uh, woman talk. I wish I could remember who she was, Um, but at the time, I just thought that was about the coolest thing I had, you know, that I had done. I think that's what kindled my desire to be a writer. Were you a uh, a big reader um, coming up, Jonathan? Oh uh, yeah, huge reader. I I read a I read uh, actually the I can't give you the whole title of the of Don Quixote, but I read that when I was about seven years old, and um, opened up. I mean, that's what I did. I mean, I, I was the person with the covers over my head and the flashlight <laughs> when I'm supposed to be asleep. And then I read my brother, who's a big science fiction fan, uh, gave me Starman's Son by Andre Norton. Uh, I was probably about eight or nine, I would guess. And that just blew my mind. I mean, you can write about worlds that don't really exist. Um, and then I was hooked that from that moment on. And I continued to read uh, my grades at the academy might have suffered a little bit because I spent most of my time reading instead of studying, but be that as it may. Um, Richard, I know that you began your writing career not writing science fiction, but writing historical fiction. Um, what What is it about science fiction that uh, that that intrigues you so much? Someone that that obviously is is uh fascinated by history and um you know some more real world um you know topics if we will but what is it about science fiction that that you know, gets you excited oh well, the great thing about science fiction is you have all the possibilities within the realms of science fiction and if you have uh, historical fiction you're you're really pretty much limited to that one time period you're at and then you kind of have to explore an aspect of that that period that you've chosen to write. My first historical fiction novel was with the Red Baron in World War One. So you, you boom. Aviation, World War One, you're kind of stuck there. If you want to, you can do a little bit more, but there's not a whole lot of places. Meanwhile, science fiction, it's the whole universe. As much as you can imagine. So I like having a, a much wider sandbox to play in. I know that both of you guys are veterans, and um, I, I personally uh, didn't serve, but uh, my father was an Air Force veteran. My 
father-in-law was also an Air Force veteran. Uh, my my grandfather's uh, served in World War II, and um, you know, there, there's there's lots of history and lots of connection there. Um, Richard, where where did you serve, and uh, what was what was the um, uh, what was your job? I graduated from the United States Military Academy in 2001 and was commissioned into field artillery. And I first duty station was at Fort Polk, Louisiana. Easy way to find that. If you look at a map of Louisiana and just look where there's nothing. That's where Fort Polk. <laughs> and uh, from there, I had my first yeah. deployment to Iraq, which lasted 15 months. And then after that, I got smart and switched from field artillery to military intelligence and then did another tour uh, in Iraq. With the 101st Airborne Division, excuse me, it's, it's now the 101st Air Assault. It's changed the name. And I, then I finished up my active duty time in Korea with the Aviation Brigade. What about you, Jonathan? Uh, I, I know you're also a veteran. Where where did you serve, and and what was uh, uh, what did you do in the military? Well, I went uh, at first. I enlisted into the Navy, but I never reported to boot camp. Never reported to Great Lakes because I got my appointment to the Naval Academy. I uh, graduated in 1979, took my commission in the Marine Corps. Uh, I was an infantry officer for 30 years, um, served in all around the world, served in Iraq. Uh, my combat tour was in Iraq, where I was the uh, military liaison to uh, USAID, which got me around, uh, got me around the country quite a bit. Uh, I had to actually come back and testify in front of Congress about things that were happening. I uh, spent a lot of time in Jordan speaking with the uh, with the sheiks. And my big claim to fame is that an uh, uh, Army uh, major told me that al-Qaeda had actually put a reward on my head. But it was only 10000 bucks, which was kind of demeaning. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Richard, you are the author of one of my all-time favorite series, and that's the Ember War uh, oh, saga. Okay. Where where is the Ember War saga right now? Where um is, is that completely finished? Where, where are you in that world? The good news, there's much more Ember War coming. And right now, I I've done two Pathfinder books, and if, if within the Ember War, the Pathfinders are kind of the the Stargate team slash search and rescue uh, folks of of the, of the good human government. And I've got two books co-written with Ben Stevens. That one will be out at the end of this month, and the next one. We'll be out at the end of November. And then uh, we go to volume three of the Ember War, which starts with the Ibarra Crusade. And that third volume will be should be the end of the Ember War books that I have planned. You say that, but we'll see. It, we'll see if there's actually an end to it. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, um, you have uh, you've not been on the show before, and we, we definitely need to correct that uh, in the near future and, and have. An episode of your own to come on and talk, but um, th- tell us a little bit about your uh, your publishing story. How did you get started in writing, and uh, what what was your breakout book? Well, I started publishing. I, I published a, a science fiction short story back in 1978. Um, now that I read it again, it maybe wasn't the best story in the world. But then during my military career, I did not write any fiction. Uh, I was writing um, military articles, political science articles, um, things like that. Um, Published one book on the tuna industry, of all things. Uh, But when I was in Iraq, you know, not a lot you could do when you do have some free time. So I decided I was going to finally write my novel. It was military fiction. and I. No one is ever going to read anything that I wrote right. So I, I just went to a vanity publisher and bought basically 20 copies of the book. Um, and they also and, and they put it on uh, Amazon for like 19 bucks or something like that. And over the next four or five years, I think I made um, $98 in royalties. Uh, and then I finally I, I some guy told me about um, ebooks. And and the vanity press wouldn't. I had to pay them seventy more dollars to get it ready for an ebook. But at that, that time, I kind of heard about self publishing, so I put it up myself. My surprise, sold about four hundred copies that first month, and seven hundred copies the next month. 
Um, but that really wasn't my breakup book. That just gave me, I had killed off a lot of the people in the first book, but people started contacting me saying, hey, where's book two? Where's book three? So I wrote those kind of as a hobby. You know, I, you know, I was making, I was getting readers. But then my first breakout book was my first military science fiction book called Recruit. And um, that did very, very well, um, extremely well. And so uh, from then I ended up writing more and more. And I was working at the time. I had retired by this time. And I was working uh, for a manufacturing company in Thailand. And I kept doing that because I was afraid that this was a flash in the pan, I guess. But finally, January 2017, I quit my job, came back to the States. And I've been a full-time writer ever since. Um, I've been nominated twice for a Nebula, once for a Dragon. And I'm a USA Today best-selling writer. And this is, well, other than the fact that caring for my two little 21-month-old twin girls, uh, writing is pretty much my life. Sad. So, um, Richard, um, how, how did you come to meet uh, Jonathan, and, and where did this collaboration begin? But John and I, I, I knew of him just because of his military science fiction work. And then he and I are both involved in uh, Science Fiction uh, Prize of America and then also with 20 books to 50K. And uh, we've been on panels together two or three, maybe even four times. So, And also, uh, he re recently moved from Las Vegas. Where, so we were both living in Las Vegas at the same time. So it was real easy to coordinate. You could say, hey, which which breakfast place do you want to go to? This one. Okay, go on. There. And so... I had the idea for this book See, really back when I was like 12 years old. I was walking through a movie theater and I saw a poster for a movie called The Fourth War. It had Ray Schneider and Jürgen Prochnow in it. And it was this Cold War story where these two commanders on the Czech border are fighting each other. And I really wanted to see it, but my mother wouldn't let me because I was like 11 years old at the time. And she was worried that I would you know, be too excited about about. You know, violent stuff, well, stuff. Violent the army. but so but i always had the idea that huh two commanders and opposite sides and then just that idea just sat in the back of my head for decades and then i was thinking about uh doing then podium i talked to podium audio and they said hey uh what what kind of new interesting ideas do you have and i said well i have this idea where you have two distinct sides of a conflict and it's so distinct that you have to have two narrators for it, and you have to have two authors for it. So that way, it's definitely two different voices for the reader to to have in the story, and to, you know, not take a side with, but rather kind of be in between both sides and not be told who's right and who's wrong, who's a good guy and who's a bad guy, and to kind of let the reader sort of understand what it's like to be in the middle of a conflict like this. So Podium said, hey, "What did you get? What ideas do you have?" And I said, "Well, I've got this." They said, "This is great. Who do you want to write it with?" And I said, "Me." And I promptly went to John Brzee and said, "Here's the plot that I have. Here's well, what I want Podium to do with it. What do you think?" And John was on board with it. And then, you know, as soon as we yeah, we got all the approvals along the process, and then we sat down and said, "Here's the world. Here's the plot. Let's make sure our tech levels are on par, so that way we don't have." You know, one side armed with nuclear giant war robots, and the other side's got you know slingshots. And then we just we went had a lot of back and forth of you do this, I do this, and then you know, make sure oh you want to have this payoff in the third act. Well, in the first act, I can have this happen. So there's a lot of coordination that went into making the story flow as well as it does. John, what was your reaction when when Richard came to you with this this crazy idea to have this two sided tale? Well, we were uh, we were both at twenty books for uh, twenty books for fifty k, and uh, in in Las Vegas, and I was getting ready to go to a panel, and he walks up to me, and and broached the idea with me, and it took me it took me a little while, probably two and a half seconds, to say yes. I'm on board. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, so how long did you guys kind of pre-plan this novel? Because, uh, you know, there was a lot of coordination that had to go into this. Like, Richard, you talked about making sure the tech was on 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 a level playing field. And uh, I, I'm sure there were lots of other things. So um, I, I know you're a big 
um, plotter, uh, Richard, you know, ahead of time. Um, what was the planning phase of a novel like this like? Well, we we sat down uh, a couple of times. There was over breakfast, a couple of times over steak. And, you know, I, I had the idea. Here's the, you know, the setting is going to be this jungle world. It's going to be, you know, very reminiscent of Vietnam. But instead of, you know, a local population fighting an invader, it's two invaders fighting amidst the local population. And so we had to decide on, okay, John, what's your guys' background? John came up with the coalition, excuse me, with the alliance. And I had my background with the Gemini. Then all right, who's in the middle of this? And he, John, has a lot of experience in Southeast Asia. So we based the, you know, the, the civilians on that. And then it was kind of, you know, laid out. Here's all the big beat, you know, from, and this is how the, the big things we had identified was where the two main characters interact. You know, uh, along the way, and then kind of just how the two stories weave into each other along along that path. So there was a, like the file we have for the back and forth where he changes something in the word document and sends it back to me. It, it dozens and dozens of uh, of iteration. So it, it took it took quite a while, but you know that's the kind of thing you have to do for a story like this. Well, there's uh you know there's a lot of author collaborations uh going on these days, and uh you know um someone uh, has an author come to come in to write stories inside his or her universe and and one person sort of sees uh, sort of acts as a as an overseer and and uh kind of steers the mission while the other person is doing uh, a lot of the in the trenches writing I, I see a lot of those types of relationships these days. But this seems to be a very, uh, very collaborative on on every level. Like you two guys are are telling two different stories that have to weave together. Um, John, what were some of the logistics that you guys had to overcome to tell a story like this? I, I think it was the fact that while we while we knew where the story was going, and we knew the beats, it. it we had to get down to the details because if I mentioned some sort of weapon or some sort of technology that we hadn't really discussed, it has to fit in with what Richard's writing and vice versa. So I think, I mean, we, we went back and forth. What basically what we did is I wrote a chapter, Richard wrote a chapter, I wrote a chapter, Richard wrote a chapter. Um, and then we had to go back and read that chapter and, and make sure that everything fit. I mean, we had, we had a part where one of my characters was in, um, the paladin's camp, and I wrote what he did, and then Richard wrote what he from the other side, because the guys were running around the camp, and there were a lot of disconnects that then we had to get come back. Where normally, if you're writing it yourself, you're now you're on to the next chapter. Now we had to come back and go through those chapters and go through the action and go through what is said and what happens to make sure. What I'm describing and what Richard's describing is the same thing. I mean, we have a few cases where where the perception of what's happening is colored by the POV, but the action had to be the same. And, and so the logistics was, you know, that's where, as Richard's saying, it took longer to write. But that's because we were tasked with writing two different POVs and two different voices that as if it was a single writer writing the whole thing uh, and, and keeping everything uh, they're keeping everything flowing. Right. Richard, I know that you're um, a, a big plotter um, and uh, you plan things out ahead of time. That That's one of the reasons I think that you're uh, as prolific an, an author as you are. Um, but when you're dealing with a, a situation like this, do you ever find yourself uh, feeling like this is more of a game of chess where um, there are responses to John um, as, as opposed to just following the plan that's laid out ahead of time? You know, there was a lot of you know, a discovery learning along the way. So we said, okay, let's have, you know, this, here are the big beats that we're going to hit. And then John will say, well, what about this? And I say, that's great. That's brilliant. Let's do that. And then you, you had to stop and look at the whole other thing go, well, I have to change this and that this, and then you get the whole kind of the butterfly effect of, well, if you know someone gets shot in page five, what does that mean for page 112? And you back and forth, back and forth. So you know, there were a couple of times where 
you know, we, we have the story all laid out and all of a sudden it's like, hey, I see something that needs to be added. Let me add this in. And then there's other times where like, let's, we wanted to, like, we talked about having a battle on a bridge. And then we have the whole story laid out and like, well, where does the battle on the bridge happen? Didn't fit anywhere. So it didn't happen. So, it, you know, it was a good thing about the whole experience was you have the idea, but then, you know, any collaboration, the story is going to morph a little bit and it morphed to become even better. So, you know, I enjoyed having someone else come in and say, you know, let's have this. And like, that's great. Let's do that. And then that just makes it far better. Richard, you said that this um, this project really started with a conversation that you had with Podium Publishing. Um, we we know that uh, that audiobooks are the the biggest growth market in in book publishing right now, um, and you know lots of great stuff is going on in the audio space. But at, from the writer's perspective, um, does knowing that that the the primary vehicle for a project like this is going to be audio book that's that's the driving force from the beginning does that affect the writing uh, in from your perspective richard do you see an uh, a project that you know is going to be you know primarily an audiobook project from the beginning does that change the way you write it, it the, the one thing that i did kind of put in was a little bit more the term of it's sort of a uh, um, moments where the 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 actor or the narrator could really get some meat, where he had a long soliloquy of talking about a story, you know, we, where it's not back and forth, back and forth. Rather, it's that one kind of the character, the narrator is going to stop, and he's going to have a nice, slow, you know, uh, let's, let's say a close up of just his voice. And so I, I put in a couple of those, and. and all those it really added to the story, which I didn't. I don't think was a problem. And it was you. It added to character, and if something is adding to character, generally you should, you should do it. So I didn't have any problem with that. And the audio with this book, uh, we got two Hollywood A-listers for this. We have Giancarlo Esposito from Breaking Bad and The Mandalorian. He narrates uh, the, the part of Captain Alcazar, written by John. And then I have Eric Dane narrating uh, Major Richter from mine, and when we started the project, we did not know who the narrator was going to be. And the podium, you know, they were approaching other actors to do this. And along the way, I'm just like, it, all the names just kept getting more recognizable, more recognizable. And finally, they said, okay, we've got uh, Eric Dane signed. I'm like, wow, from, you know, Mick Steamy, as most, uh, a, lot of, a lot of ladies out there would know him as. Also, his last fleet, which my wife and I have seen. And then they got Giancarlo Esposito. And I was like, wow, like Gus? Gus Fring is going to be narrating this. Oh my gosh, this is going to be great. So it was, uh, you know, the narration just really became absolute bonus for the whole story. That's amazing. Um, John, what about you? Do you, um, do you take into consideration, uh, that this is going to be acted out by, uh, by voice actors and be presented as an audio book that does that go through your mind at all in the writing? Yeah, it did. Um, I had to, I, in one way, you're thinking a little bit in the mind of a screenwriter, of a screenwriter. But on the other hand, we're still doing, you know, the ebook, the paperback, the hardback. Um, so you have to kind of marry the two and you have to kind of think and, and word choice. You know, sometimes I may use words, particularly in, in the narrative that people don't generally use in, in conversation or, or that may, uh, there, there are a lot of words that have great meanings, but um, uh, sometimes trip people up in, in, in pronunciation and things. And so I had to keep that in mind um, while I was writing. Um, it did affect the storyline, but it did affect a little bit of my uh, of the the tempo and, and word choice. I think. The Novel Factory Online is software for the serious writer. With features like notes that are automatically organized, that means no more drowning in piles of paper, notes, or spending hours organizing digital folder structures. The Novel Factory offers clear, obvious structures for noting down information about plot, characters, locations, and everything else relating to your novel. Innovative features like the roadmap take you from concept to finished novel. The Roadmap is an optional step-by-step -step guide to writing a novel that takes you from the premise to final manuscript and beyond. It draws on tried-and-true, tested theory 
that lies behind the majority of best-selling novels and blockbuster movies. Access your writing anywhere. The web version of the Novel Factory can be accessed anywhere you have internet. So you can write your novel on the train to work, while walking the dog, or climbing a mountain. Just log in and all your drafts and notes will be at your fingertips. Go to novel-writer.com to see how this powerful software can unleash your creative side. Use code HANK2020 for 20% off. That's the Novel Factory. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you pub-site.com the place to help authors find their home on the web that's uh you brought up a, a great point john um and and i want to ask richard about this uh, richard in in science fiction a, a lot of times especially in fantasy um the writers come up with some of the craziest names and uh, they, they just love to cram consonants together um for for whatever reason and and audiobooks um you know that this brings up a great point in you know a, a reader being able to pronounce these names and you know it kind of a maybe an unattended unintended side effect is that however the the narrator pronounces it kind of becomes canon in a lot of ways that's the way people interpret that um does the advent of maybe not the advent of audiobooks but the popularity of audiobooks lately does that change uh the way some of these names and characters um get done yeah there's been a couple of times when i've been writing where i thought you know okay here's this character's name it looks fine on paper but then i'll stop and think how the heck does this narrator say it I'm like well maybe i'll make it a little easier on the poor guy and because i'm always of the opinion that writing should be as smooth as possible and anytime you throw in a really quirky name it upsets the reader's immersion and that upsets the reader's enjoyment. So I try not to you know, throw speed bumps at the reader or at the narrator. But, you know, when it comes to podium, they're a professional, real professional group. And when you turn in a manuscript, you soon also have to turn in uh, pronunciation and style guide. So that way, you know, you don't have somebody saying something one way and then it, it's not the way it is in the author's head. For me, uh, Luke Daniels, who's one of the most brilliant narrators out there, he, one of the evil alien races within the Ember War, in my mind, is pronounced the Toth. But when you listen to the audiobook, they become the Toth. And I just know at some point I'm going to be at a convention and somebody's going to come up to me and ask me about the Toth. I'm going to look at them funny because I don't quite understand. <laughs> so, yeah. You're absolutely right. And for me, Luke Daniels um, made me fall in love with the Ember War series because I listened to that first audiobook with him first before i read any of the books and and uh it, it just it enhanced the experience for me uh a hundred percent um 
military sci-fi is a uh, is is a huge genre uh, or subgenre right now, and uh, I, I think the the name of the genre maybe turns off some readers that uh, that feel like they're that's not for them. Um, but I have found that in military sci-fi, you get some of the um, some really great character depth. Um, some great world building. There, there are lots of things there for people that may not associate themselves with with military stories. Um, John, what is it about military sci-fi that you think uh, creates a a big umbrella uh, for readers that that uh, maybe you know would uh, that that readers would love that they think that they might not love? What what is it about military sci-fi that makes for a great genre to read in? The, the thing about military sci-fi is that you have a built-in um, dramatic threat, so to speak. You know, there there is always there is something happening that 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 increases um, the depth of the of everything, the action, the emotion, the danger. Uh, uh, if you don't, I mean, you know, you're at war. If you do things wrong, what's the result? It's going to be death. But it, I think a lot of people think that military sci-fi is just a bunch of gun nut um, talking about calibers, and except for instead of calibers, it's blasters. But if you look at some of the biggest mil, military sci-fi, I mean, what's the Forever War? You know, it's not. It, it is a book about some of the the evils, I guess, of of war. Um, it, you know, it's the all quiet of the Western Front of, of military sci-fi. So you can get. The, there are with, within the range of the genre, which is the largest subgenre within science fiction. Um, within that subgenre, you can get books that are the equivalent of of, of the weapon, you know, the weaponry, the high tech. You can get the books that are more on what happens to the people, uh, the emotions, and everything. It, it, it expands the broad gamut. That is offered in every other genre of, of hard science fiction, of space opera, um, of dystopian. All those genres can fit of what you're doing can fit within the military sci-fi genre. And it's just by the fact that they're military, it just ups the ante and, and, and gives um, more prevalence to the environment of, of what's happening, the setting. I think that's a great description. Um, what about you, Richard? What What is it about military sci-fi that might appeal to more readers than they think that that it uh, it may fit them? You know, it, Isaac Asimov said that science fiction can be a mask put on any kind of story you want, and that I I, I believe and I agree with Asimov on that. And when it comes to military sci-fi, you can still you can get whatever kind of story you want, and then you have this kind of overarching character of the war that's always there and always present. And then I kind of like that, you know, the war is its own character, but, and the war does what it wants to do. And the, and the people who are in the middle of it generally, you know, they're kind of swept up. So there's always this sense of tension. There's always such a moving forward of, you know, that, that the great thing about military science fiction is, you know, it comes with a promise of battles. It comes with a promise of, of conflict. So, you know, it's going to be, you know, if it's told well, very entertaining. So I think people, you know, can, can sit down with a good military science fiction book and one, you know, have the, the excitement of, of uh, you know, the shooting and the banging uh, and the fighting with aliens. And you can also have a good kind of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, theory behind it. Look at Starship Troopers. It begins and ends with some of the best sci-fi battles ever, in my opinion. And in the middle, there's a great sort of moral discussion that happened during the course of, of the story, which I think has really only become more heightened in 2020. Different discussion. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, Richard, that Hell's Horizon is a self-contained story. It, uh, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, um, but there's the potential and possibilities for spinoffs um it, when you guys completed this book and and i know that it was uh kind of much more intense and 
um, and and time consuming that other projects may have been. Uh, but how do you see the future? Uh, do, do you see um, spinoffs or, or continuing stories or um, how do you feel about it at the end here? You know, uh, the hegemony has a story to, to still tell that's within uh, Hell's Horizon. And that is the, the faction that uh, Major Richter was trying to. And I would like to very much return to this universe and tell what happens to the hegemony. Because if you read the book, you kind of learn that, you know, the hegemony presents this space of unity and, you know, uh, you know being a good actor. But, you know, if you read between the lines of a lot of things that's happening to Major Richter uh, during the course of the story, you realize there are some fault lines, big ones within the hegemony that could break right apart. So I would love to come back to the hegemony, but for the rest of 2020 and, and 2021, I want to uh, give closure to a lot of my readers with a lot of my series that I have out there. So I plan on finishing um, the last of the Ember War books that are currently planned. The Exiled Fleet, which uh, I left readers hanging. I got to finish that. And then I have an upcoming series called The Tear, which I'm going to you know, publish book one, two, three, what right after each other in 2021. And so I want to have all that done, give all my readers closure to know that everything they pick up from me is a safe read. I'm looking at you, George Martin. So that way, and then I, and then I can come back to the hegemony. I, I think that's a great plan. Uh, what What about you, John? How do you feel uh, about this story at the ending here, and and what might possibly come next? Well, I definitely would like to go back into the alliance. Uh, I believe there's a lot of things we can. I mean, we we had this book was really looking at two individuals, but it it opened the door to this whole new universe. But like Richard, I've got. I've got to finish off my Ghost Marine series. Um, I'm uh, I'm working with Jeff Cheney on a series right now. I've got some commitments with Chuck Gannon and Chris Kennedy. Um, so I've got a, I've got quite a few things on my plate. But I could and the biggest thing is my productivity has gone down with uh, with the twins. Um, you know, little girls take up an awful lot of time. I in, in we moved to Colorado Springs and they wouldn't let me write. So in my office, so I had to get doors installed, but I made the mistake of having glass windows. And now, you know, I look, I hear something, I look around my computer screen and there's two little girls with their faces pressed up against the window, you know, wanting to come in. So anyway, uh, you know, they are my, my, my priority now, but that is, that is affecting my productivity. So I, I, I would not be able to, uh, get to the Alliance until, Geez, mid to late 2021, but I think I'd like to do it. I think there's an awful lot of story to be told uh, within the Alliance and the greater universe that we that we created. I, I've got a question that I want to ask both of you guys, and I, I've been asking um, authors off and on about this. Um, the you know the year 2020 has brought all manner of um, challenges. Let's just put it that way to to all of us. And uh, you know this this uh, pandemic that we've been living under, and then you know uh, all of the things that come with that. And I think that's probably the nicest way I can say that without getting uh, you know into murky waters here um, with lockdowns and all of that. Um, you know there it has affected people in differently, um, and for writers. A lot of times we we work from home and we sit in an office by ourselves uh, with a computer uh, for, you know, most days. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't think that uh, that being under a lockdown and, and, you know, all the restrictions would have much effect on writers. But but it has had an effect on writers. And there's a lot of mental aspects and things like that that have been going on. Um, How has how has this year affected each of you guys? Um, and Richard, uh, has it affected you at all and um, your your productivity or how are you kind of dealing with the the stuff that's going on? Well, it's, uh, I have two school age boys and they've been home for most of 2020. And, but two of them are finally going to school in the afternoon. So that was a, a bit of a ding. But, you know, uh, one thing that was a problem is the 20 books to 50K, which is hosted here in lovely Las Vegas, got canceled, which was a big 
bummer for me. And then also a lot of the other great conventions that are happening uh, across the country and even the world are getting put aside. And I really enjoyed those because when it comes time for 20 books, people I know show up in Las Vegas. It's amazing. I That was like the highlight of my social, my social highlight of the year was 20 books. Okay. So that was put aside. Now, one thing that has been helpful is that I, I was writing the book uh, for the tier. And one of the, the major plot points is that these invading humans uh, can't come down to the planet they want to take over until they've got some immunity to the diseases there. And thanks to coronavirus, a lot of readers now have a much better understanding of how immunity works. So that was, you know, I didn't have to explain that in the book. Because now you've been paying attention and all you know that. And it also gave me some great opportunity for some toilet paper hoarding jokes, which really <laughs> I think I nailed in that book. I <laughs> love it. Um, John, you mentioned that you recently relocated to uh, Colorado Springs. Um, was that this year? And, and how has 2020 affected uh, your productivity and, and your mental shape uh, as a writer? Yeah, yeah. We, we moved in uh, July 31st. Um, and it was more difficult because of uh, COVID. The, um, Normally there are there were I think six times as many houses available. Um, we had a very specific uh, district we wanted uh, because of the girls for the school, which is why we moved out of Las Vegas. Uh, we needed decent schools for the girls, um, and so we, it was much more difficult to buy the house where we wanted up on um, we're in the Broadmoor region of, of of Colorado Springs, and there just weren't very many houses available, but. Uh, once we finally got settled, um, as far as writing at home, no, I don't think it's affected me really at all. Uh, I, the girls are 21 months. They'd be here no matter what. That's affected me more than anything else. However, as Richard said, when 20 books to 50K was canceled, that was a big – I mean, I, I I go to a lot of conventions. I was supposed to go to New Zealand for WorldCon. Um uh, you know, I had uh, a, a Dragon Con, Comic Con. I usually, I, I, I go and I, I'm on panels on all these cons. Um, and I had, I had, what, I had seven cons lined up. And this is where I go to meet my fans and rejuvenate myself and hang out with other writers. And it offers a lot of opportunities. Um, when you talk to other people and you think about, well, why let's do an anthology or this kind of stuff. And so, not going to the cons has been a major impact, I think, with regards to COVID. And I'm, I only went to one this year, and that was in Chicago, and that was before everything started locking down. And so I really miss that, not just on a social level, but it does make me a better writer, I think, and, and brings up opportunities and things that I want to do. Well, let's hope uh, that 2021 uh... – brings about some uh some respite from all of this and i i completely agree with you guys um it, we need some of this social interaction and and let's hope it gets back to that um hell's horizon out available everywhere now kindle edition uh hardcover also audiobook which i'm going to be picking up this afternoon i i didn't realize uh that uh that it was the production that it is and and i'll be grabbing that this afternoon and digging into it. Um, Richard, Jonathan, uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Uh, Richard, tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do. Hey, you know, if you want to read my books, the best place to go is Amazon.com, throw in my name, and I suggest starting with The Ember War. It's one of my favorite books. A lot of people like that, too. And then uh, also come to Facebook, type in Richard Fox Author, leave a like, and uh, stay a while. I hope to hear from you. Absolutely. How about you, John? Where can people find you? Uh, my website is jonathanbrazy.com. Uh, my Facebook is uh, Jonathan Brazy Author. Uh, those are probably the best places. If you're going to, uh, I have, I don't just write military sci fi, I write also have military fiction, paranormal. My Werewolf of Marines is one of my favorites, uh, historical fiction. Um, so I, I have, I go cross genre. Although a lot of it is military oriented, but JonathanBrazy.com, you should be able to find uh, links to all my books and see some pictures of me when I was a kid on a burrow in Mexico City. 
We'll put links to all those places to make it easy for people to find you and uh, to pick up the book as well. Uh, Richard, Jonathan, thank you guys so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having us. Do you want to get paid to write stories? Do you enjoy collaborating with other talented storytellers? Do you want to work completely remotely and set your own hours? Relay Publishing is looking for writers and editors to work on fiction projects across a range of genres, from thrillers to sci-fi, fantasy, and romance. The Relay process is extremely collaborative, in the same vein as a TV show's writer's room. If you're a story geek, then you'll be on a great team. There are seven ghostwriting positions and ten editing positions currently available. Please go to www.recruitment.relaypub.com. That's www.recruitment.relaypub.com for more information on how to apply. Join a great storytelling team today. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. Invasion Day, the first book in the They Came for Blood series by Scott Moon. David Osage is a dangerous man with a complicated past, but these days he's just trying to keep his head down, driving big rigs. One night he saddles himself with a hitchhiker a nuisance who's more than she seemed. And that's when everything changes. No one was ready for an alien invasion. Death is raining from the sky and the only questions left is do you run, fight, or submit? For David Osage and his family, answering is as easy as giving the alien invaders the finger. Grab book one, Invasion Day, in the They Came for Blood series and then follow it up with book two, Resistance Day, and book three, Victory Day. Available at Amazon.com.